I would like then to invite our first international panelist, who is Professor Karen Mosberger. She is a professor at Arizona State University, ASU, and she is a director of the recent funded Center of Technology of that same university, where she has been addressing several inequalities, impacts of the use of technology, and local governance. She is an author of several books, including Digital Cities, Internet, uh, Geography and Opportunities. And she's been uh, acknowledged with a number of prizes in this area and awards. Now you have the floor, Professor Karen, for your presentation. You have half an hour, 30 minutes, and then I will invite all other panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Fabio, and thank you to Nick Biar and Citic uh, for the invitation here. I'm really honored to be invited um, to this seminar, but also to be here to see the innovation and the leadership here. So my talk is going to be based very much on the US context, but I'm looking forward to the discussion afterward um, uh, to talk about possible implications um, uh, in Brazil, Sao Paulo especially, um, and, and to make some comparisons. So, before beginning, I want to acknowledge my co-authors. All of this work I'm presenting um, is co-authored, and a lot of this is from a book manuscript just completed last week with Carolyn Tolbert and Scott Lacombe at the University of Iowa. And I'll show some of our Chicago research that I did with Carolyn, too. And so I'd also like to acknowledge um, the sponsorship we've received from various organizations that have helped us to do this research. Okay, so um, I want to start talking in the beginning not about digital inequality per se, but about income inequality and economic opportunity in the US, this kind of larger picture, this larger context behind digital inequality and um, behind the story that I want to talk about. So if you look on the left, you see this graph, you see this line going up. That's income in the US since, oh, the 60s. Um, but then you see the flat line underneath, this gray line, the lighter line, and that's the bottom 50% of earners in the US, and that's been flat now since the 1960s. And they have not experienced the kinds of increases that we've seen in the population overall. So there's greater income inequality in the US in recent decades. And then if you look on the right, this is some work done by an economist named Raj Chetty. You may have seen some of his work. Um, and he's looking at intergenerational opportunity or um, the chances that someone at age 30 will make more than their parents made. And you see this line going down quickly since the 1980s. Um, and so intergenerational mobility, um, doing better than your parents, this idea of the American dream, that's gone down sharply since the 1980s. So this is the larger context. This is individual level data, but we see this trend across communities as well. So especially in the last election in 2016, before that with the Occupy movement in the US, now for a while there have been a lot of debates about um, not only individual inequality, but places being left behind too in the digital age. Um, and, and economically being left behind. So um, it, some uh, scholars have called this the great divergence 
uh, think tanks have called it the great reshuffling. Um, in terms of differences across cities, winner take all urbanism, with some cities winning and others losing quite badly in recent years. So we see in the press, and these are from some think tanks, um, this idea of two Americas getting further apart, pulling apart, um, and uh, in including superstar cities that succeed while others fall behind. And there's been a lot about technology, especially big tech, the big tech firms, their role in driving this regional inequality. Um, but technology matters more generally than just big tech. So what we see um, are, uh, what we see over the last few decades is it, uh, this longer term trend, it's really structural change in the economy. After World War II for the first few decades, we saw wage gaps between communities, between places growing smaller, and since the 1980s, they've gotten larger across places. Um, this happened uh, as I said, since the 1980s, so long before the Great Recession, but it accelerated then, and it has continued even during the recovery that we still see places getting more and more unequal. Um, I mentioned this idea, the rise of the superstar cities, places in Silicon Valley and on the coasts where there's a lot of big tech investment, these tech hubs. Um, but also places like my city of Detroit, where I'm originally from, former manufacturing centers in the heartland that are falling behind. And this is based on uh, change, uh, skill bias change, changes in the skills required in the economy. Um, and I'm going to talk about how that matters for some things like clustering and uh, concentration of activity. Um, rural communities also uh, have lagged behind uh, since the recession and have not recovered as well. Uh, and, you know, all this rising inequality may matter for a generation. It has long term effects because, as some of Raj Chetty's work has shown, and this was mentioned earlier, the place where children grow up. Uh, those places matter for lifetime income and opportunity, and this matters down to the neighborhood level. Um, children living a few miles apart uh, can have very different outcomes because of the influence of the neighborhood context and, and how that sets them up for opportunity or not. Okay, so the role of technology, there's been a lot of discussion about how the technology economy concentrates activity in these kinds of ecosystems of innovation or the, the tech hubs uh, in certain cities. Uh, and this concentration of activity is because innovation today is based on the exchange of ideas and interactions and the kind of new ideas that get sparked through those interactions. Um, and cities, cities like Sao Paulo that are very dense, uh, these big metropolitan areas world over have incredible advantages because the density um, encourages these kinds of interactions. The diversity of the populations means that there's this diversity of ideas and it really contributes toward innovation. There's been a lot of research by economists on this. So it's also increased the premium for education and for skill. Um, meaning that there are bigger rewards for individuals with more education. And uh, this matters so much today for innovation, uh, for places, for individual outcomes that some economists like Enrico Moretti have said that the 21st century is really the human capital century. But human capital in the digital economy and the digital society might be 
broader, we argue, than the way it's been defined, which is you know, a bunch of engineers in a tech hub, uh, highly educated engineers. We need to think about other aspects of digital human capital. So we argue that um, the way that human capital has been looked at is too narrow. Um, it's usually uh, in, in economic studies, examined in terms of the percentage of the population that's college educated. Or, you know, technology is defined as the share of employment in IT in a city or a metropolitan area. Um, but we think that digital human capital is broader that it's also about widespread broadband use, widespread technology use in the population as digital human capital for their communities. And why is this so? There are, there are several reasons. First of all, it's already been mentioned today, this represents skills for jobs and for entrepreneurship. So these digital skills are useful in the economy. In different kinds of occupations and businesses. But it also means that individuals have access to information that can help them in other ways to build their own human capital. So it was mentioned education and job search and internet use for health information to stay healthy and be able to work. Mobility, getting around the city, transit. All of this has been called, um, Esther Hargitay has written about this as uh, human capital enhancing activities of the internet. But the third way that this can matter is, you know, the m more widespread broadband use, um, or uh, we're going to be measuring broadband use, or technology use is in a community you have richer, denser networks for this exchange of ideas and interactions, just the way that big cities like Sao Paulo or Chicago or other big cities um, offer a, really a platform or a place for interactions in physical space um, to the extent that more people in a community are online, they're more networked and, and engaged in these interactions as well. So, Finally, we know that growth and productivity in the economy results not just from what high-tech firms do or the technology industry, but from the applications of technology across all kinds of jobs and in all kinds of sectors. Um, so beyond tech firms can widespread broadband adoption in communities by the population, can that lead to um, favorable economic outcomes, things like prosperity and growth. Um, we know at the individual level that um, technology use on the job or even at home matters for wages, including for less educated workers who have a high school education or less. It's not all just those engineers. It matters for middle school jobs, uh, middle skill jobs that um, demand uh, some technology use, but not necessarily a college education for opportunity jobs where people can move up the career ladder. And internationally, so the other research is in the US, but internationally the OECD has done some research on skills, including how general skills, general digital literacy matters for wages and for economic outcomes. Um, in public policy, assumes that um, you know it's not just the individual level skills, but that there are benefits, spillover benefits for communities and society as well when people acquire these skills, this digital human capital. So we need better evidence though, in the US at least, on um, how broadband use matters. Um, so most of the prior research at the community level has been about the availability of high-speed networks or deployment. And that's because that's the data that's been available. Um, uh, so even so, um, that 
research on availability or deployment shows generally positive effects for communities as you know availability increases for things like local employment or wages uh, for businesses. Um, some studies show that local residents don't always benefit, um, but that there is some boost to the economy. Sometimes the jobs don't go to local residents. Um, there was one interesting study that used some data. It was kind of rough data by quintiles in you know five categories, zero to 20%, 20 to 40%, that looked at broadband subscriptions or broadband adoption and how that compared to some data on broadband availability. And this was only for rural counties. I'll talk about counties in a minute, rural communities. Um, and they found that broadband adoption or broadband subscriptions in the population mattered more, that there was this stronger positive economic effect from that than just deployment or availability of high-speed internet. And that's because infrastructure or availability isn't the same as use. Um, of course, you may have availability in an area and people can't afford the technology or they don't have the skills to use it. So broadband adoption uh, or broadband use is really, we're trying to get at how people actually use broadband. Um, subscriptions, at least, uh, we have argued is a good proxy for that uh, because it means people have adopted broadband. And that's where the gap, the biggest gap is in the US. Uh, in some rural areas, there's a lack of availability. But even where it's available, people often can't afford it. So this subscription gap is really the, the heart of the problem for much of the United States. Um, and broadband's more expensive in the US than in many developed countries, and we have greater income inequality than in many other developed countries. And it's very much patterned by place, rural and urban and different cities. Uh, you'll see some of that in a few minutes. So inequality is patterned by place, and digital inequality is too. Um, so broadband subscriptions, as I said, are a better measure of adoption and use. What we're really trying to get at, this digital human capital at the community level. Um, so there has been some data. I mentioned this quintile data. Um, but it's not really sensitive enough to look at change over time, you know, going from 20% sent to 39%, that's a pretty big difference. Um, it's, it's not a very good measure of change or differences across communities. There's some new data coming out of the census from what's called the American Community Survey that's only been available for since 2013 and only for places 65,000 or more. Um, just last year, it was available everywhere for all census tracts, all counties, but we have one year of that. Um, but that's been helpful um, to put some of this in perspective to look at the whole picture. So in our work, we're looking at what about all communities? There were those positive results for rural communities in some of the previous work. What about rural and urban together and how does broadband use matter for community outcomes? So. We look at this over time, and it's important, so we're using time series data in much of this where we can, uh, and it's important to look at outcomes over time because that way we can look at which came first. As broadband adoption increases in a community, after that, what happens? Do you see, um, you know, more growth or more prosperity, and does that come after the increase in broadband? Otherwise, if you're looking at a single point in time, you don't know whether it's just more affluent or more prosperous communities that have higher levels of broadband adoption, and that, it, and they do, and that's why you're getting these better outcomes for those communities. So we look at this over time, so we can try to address whether broadband is really a cause of growth or prosperity, the things that we're 
looking at. So I just want to mention we have nearly two decades of data. I, I said the, public, the government data wasn't available on broadband subscriptions, but we had a project funded by the National Science Foundation where we used some other census data that was a smaller sample. And before there was government data available, we took the national data and looked at where people were located and we did estimates of broadband adoption since 2000 um, for the 50 largest metros in their cities and for um, the largest counties. We didn't, couldn't do all the counties, but we had the largest. And some of those were rural too, because in the West you'll see later um, some of those counties are large. Um, and I need to tell you what counties are in a minute. So uh, I'm going to talk, just quickly run through, you know, a, a, a quick overview of our results. And we have um, results for counties and for metros. So a county is, um, it's a subdivision of a state. It's bigger than a city. It's smaller than a state. Um, and they're really administrative arms of the states. Each state depend, you know, defines the county lines and how many counties they have and what they do. But they're useful for looking at because if we look at every county in the US, we can compare urban and rural. So it's not just a rural story or not just an urban story. And you know, we can't do that with metros, although we look at them too. We have multiple models. I'm not going to go through all the methods. In some places, we only have that data for one year comparing places. Um, but we've used some things called instrumental variables to get at causation. The really important part of this, though, is the time series looking at this over time that I mentioned. So we're looking at uh, our explanatory variable that we're interested in is the percentage of broadband subscriptions in the population. Um, and outcomes, we're looking at the prosperity index uh, or a growth index, and I need to go through this quickly. Okay, so uh, for counties, the prosperity index includes things like percentage of the uh, labor force not working, poverty, high school graduation rates, um, businesses, jobs, and looking at counties throughout the US, we can see, we control for a lot of things like demographics, industries, occupations. And we can see that as broadband subscriptions increase, that there are higher scores for this prosperity index. We see higher median income for counties. We see there's this measure of change since the recession, recovery recovery since the recession. We see that's more likely in communities. Um, we see higher median income, whether for all kinds of counties, rural, urban, suburban, although suburban counties see the benef most benefit, all counties benefit. There's higher median income over time, these time series, and um, broadband adoption yeah, when combined with education has a higher benefit, but even on its own, just higher levels of broadband adoption in the community matter. So we look at the metro level, and I, it, rather than spend, so we have prosperity, which is wages and standard of living, growth, which is growth in jobs, basically, and gross metropolitan product, and looking at all the 50 largest metros over time, and we have this for that whole time series, um, broadband adoption at the metropolitan level predicts increases in prosperity, that's wages and standard of living across all models, growth or growth in jobs in some models, not all of them, so it's not quite as strong, although it's still statistically significant. Um, and uh, it also predicts increases in full-time employment. So we interact that with uh, the percentage of the population that's millennials uh, between 25 and 30, and that matters. Uh, there's an interaction with 
technology employment, that increases the effect of broadband uh, subscriptions in the population. But in both cases, without millennials, without you know, IT employment, broadband matters. It's just it's increased in communities where those are present too. Okay. Um, so to sum up that part, and I can go quickly through some of the inequality, um, broadband subscriptions matter whether urban or rural in communities with a high rate of broadband adoption. We see better outcomes. Education, millennials, IT employment matter too, but even without that, broadband adoption in the population matters. And we've looked across all these different models in different ways across different communities, and still broadband still matters. And we think it's a more inclusive path to prosperity, not just trying to attract the next Amazon or Google headquarters, but the skills that are built in the population, in the community. But still, there are wide disparities. So these are counties on the left-hand side, the blue map. These are all the counties in the US. And the ones that are shaded darker have higher levels of broadband adoption or broadband subscriptions in the population. And you can see on the right, those are zip codes or postal codes. It's a little more granular, but you know the same basic pattern. Oh, um, there are some regional inequalities. The South and Southwest um, are, have lower rates of broadband adoption among other places. Um, there are these really wide disparities, though. Um, so looking at suburban Douglas County, Colorado, 95% of the population has broadband. Um, and uh, our measure of broadband includes mobile. Too. I'll talk about mobile only in a minute, um, but that's how the census co uh, counts it too. Uh, but then you see rural, small Wheeler County, Georgia, only has 24% of the population with broadband, including mobile. Navajo Nation, a tribal nation, only 27% of the population has broadband, again, including mobile. Cities are different too, though. Sunnyvale, California, and Silicon Valley, 91% of the population. Flint, Michigan, um, only 55%. And that's including cell phones. We, I'm going to show you quickly some maps um, with, uh, there's, our zip codes in Memphis, Tennessee, which is one of the lower major cities with, for broadband adoption, their zip codes were only 26% of the population has broadband, including mobile. So the, you know that's on par with the most rural areas. This is Seattle, Washington, which is the highest rate of fixed broadband adoption at 85% of the population and 90, a little over 91% if you consider mobile. The map on the left in blue is the map of broadband, all kinds of subscriptions. And then on the right in the red is cell only internet use, mobile only internet users. And you can see these are mirror images where the darker colors are higher where fixed broadband is higher in the north of the city, um, uh, you don't see as much mobile, mobile only in the south of the city. So you see these patterns where, especially in low-income communities among African Americans and, and Latinos, especially in the US, uh, mobile only has been an important um, way to connect with the internet. We see this in San Jose, California, and Silicon Valley. Um, there are some zip codes there uh, that have only 40% uh, of the population that um, have any kind of internet access. We see in Memphis, Tennessee, this is where, you know, there's some zip codes with only 26% that have any kind of broadband, including mobile. And Detroit, where I'm originally from, uh, also uh, they have the lowest rate of fixed broadband for any of the 50 major cities, um, about 
um, only 67% with mobile, but you can see, again, this varies by neighborhood as well. So how place matters. Ellen, we've done some work, um, uh, quantitative work, looking at the effects of segregation and concentrated poverty and how that magnifies barriers to adoption. Um, and that matters beyond an individual's income. Living in a poor neighborhood has an independent effect. Um, uh, Ellen talked about some of the reasons um, you know, we know neighborhood income accounts for differences. It explains the differences between African Americans and, and whites in uh, home access or fixed broadband. I'm going to skip this. And some of the reasons that neighborhood effects matter, you know, unequal educational opportunity, differences in schools, unequal access to good jobs where people might learn about technology, in people's personal social networks, less exposure to IT and ways to learn informally. And poor neighborhoods often have higher prices for goods and services. Technology disparities in turn affect what people can do in neighborhoods or you know, outcomes in neighborhoods too. So um, I flipped through the, this Chicago survey. We did citywide surveys in 2008, 2011, and again in 2013. And if you're familiar with Chicago, the red and yellow and orange places have less broadband use, um, have less internet use of any kind. Um, and that's the geography of poverty in Chicago. The west side and south side are very much more poor and segregated. And we can see how this matters, not just for access, but the activities that people can perform online. Um, so uh, in places where uh, broadband adoption is low, actually, you can see West Garfield Park. Um, I have a pointer, don't I? OK, West Garfield Park here at the top. That has only 30, in 2013, had only 39% of the population that had broadband at home, like fixed broadband. You can see here, because this includes mobile, I think it's 63%, or internet use in some location is much higher, and that includes mobile and public access. But the bottom line, literally the bottom line here, the citywide averages for all of these things like health and job search and transportation and digital government and all of these different activities online are much higher in, e even though people try to get access in some way, even if they don't have it, have broadband, fixed broadband at home, you can see that all of these activities online are much lower in all of these low broadband communities, despite people trying to do the best that they can. So in just before I close, just a word, mobile is important here. Our work has shown that, you know, there's this kind of duality around mobile only internet use. It means that a lot of people who didn't have any personal access now have personal and continuous access to the internet. But there are a lot of limitations for screens and what you can do, try writing a paper and doing homework online. Um, although in focus groups, we heard about people trying to do this. Um, so there are some limits to certain activities for mobile. And we know in the US, mobile only users tend to be young, African American, Latino, low income. They live in poor neighborhoods. We can see, however, that for um, in our studies of Chicago, for African Americans and Latinos who lived in poor communities, that those who had mobile access did more political and economic activities online. So they really saw a benefit. They still did less than people who had fixed broadband at home. But there is this benefit. Um, it's, it's a step forward, although not enough. So in closing, I just want to say, you know, the, what we, uh, the results I've shown you are the first evidence 
about broadband use in the population and how it matters for economic outcomes in the US. Um, there are some policy implications for this, though. Um, that policy has to address adoption and use and not just deployment. And currently, the focus, what little there is, on digital inclusion is around rural broadband deployment, and that's not enough. That's not the biggest problem. Once, you know, um, there are connections in rural areas, there's still the problem of low-income people being able to afford it or to adopt it. Um, we can see that uh, local communities, cities, I heard about Sao Paulo today, in the US, local cities are really in a leadership position and trying to, to, um, to close these gaps, to do something around digital inclusion. But what cities alone can do is not enough. There's a need for intersectoral and intergovernmental support. Thank you, thank you. Next, I'd like to invite Professor Marta Hesch. She is a head professor of the Department of Digital Geography in Brazil at the University of Sao Paulo. And she's got a research about place inequality and future research. Professor Francisco Gaetani, para se juntar conosco, professor. I also would like to invite our next panelist, uh, Mr. Francisco Gaetani. He's an expert in public policies and governmental administration by Getulio Vargas University, and he is also a licensed professor for the same university, and he has developed some uh, jobs in the federal sphere. So, Professor Marta, could you please start? How about this tradition in studying public uh, inequalities and how will that influence uh, digital inequalities and how to make a link to chapter two of the book as you are the main writer of this chapter? Good afternoon. It's a great honor to be here today. Thanks to Flavio, Alexander, and Grazi. Indeed, as it was said, I participated at several inequality studies, not including digital exclusion. I refused. Uh, immediately to include that, but afterwards I was convinced about the relevance to include inequalities as part of the chapters. I'm very glad to have had the chance to listen to Mrs. Helsper as well as Mosberger, both of you were very important in my trajectory and your uh, articles and paper had influenced my research a great deal. If I had to ask you to raise your hands about those who know about digital stuff and not, I would be in the end of the list. I'm still starting to learn about this topic, still crawling in this field. And now I'm fully convinced about the importance to include inequality, digital inequality, in our map of inequalities. And I'm also 100% convinced that a full understanding about this topic goes throughout understanding spatial inequalities first, as well as any other public goods, individual access or collective access is affected by territorial issues as I intend to show you next.
my research is based on PNAD's continuous NICTs. That information was extremely important and very useful to my understanding as they reached the same conclusion as I did about inequality issues, the rhetorical inequality issues of public goods. And in terms of national data, they just hide in territorial inequalities, meaningful ones. And territorial inequalities, as far as I understand, they are less explained by income than by the poverty spatial distribution. And this is what I will show you. I will briefly address this because my peers have talked about that before, where they say that uh, digital inequalities are the, an opportunity to overcome spatial barriers and to step out of that condition of exclusion, social deprivation, or if that reproduces offline inequalities. Well, let's go straight to numbers and data that has been extracted from Pinadi Continuum with the collaboration of Edgar Fosado, a researcher. Here we have internet users in Brazil, those older than 10 years of age who declared to have access uh, to internet in the past three months, where number of users per region is unequal. Regions with those uh, regions of higher poverty, they have a lower participation than other regions. Therefore, the number of non-users in the regions of higher poverty concentration is higher. This division is a breakout that is showed by all international studies, rural and urban division. Here we have uh, uh, users and non-users by region and the number of non-users in the rural region is greater than the number of users and there is a higher concentration in those areas where there is a higher concentration of poverty. And users by category, according to our guest theory, where we should divide the users according to different categories. And according to ICT's information, which allows us to work with a higher level of confidence if we divide that by states. And based on uh, Caden's uh, work, I classified the second class users. Who are they? They are those who use uh, smartphones, cell phones, they use uh, public devices wired uh, phones. If we want to know who are the first class users represented by the blue line, those that have access to broadband and also to personal computers access, there is a huge distance between what we understand as being second class users, which is the main information we have in comparison to those of first class users. And as uh, Karen just showed us, uh, the internet will benefit, will add economic benefits to this minority, the first class users, and the increase of that use preserved that standard 
If we see that by states, here we have uh, welfare, wealth countries, and these are those who are poor countries with some economic consequences as well as political ones. Here we have uh, poorer states. This is the state uh, by a state as it is known as a state of low connectivity. And the main connection is supported by second class users and of low quality. If elections in Brazil, they are explained throughout uh, internet resources that, of course, takes to unequal results by different regions. And I keep asking myself if those that use the digital tools as their main political campaign tools, would they probably have a low performance in those regions due to ideological reasons or due to political party issues or because of the tools they use do not work fine in the regions where there is a smaller or lower connectivity? What do I mean by all of that? That all sort of implications that we believe that internet will add to uh, users' economic life and to subjects' political aspects, they have to be understood as first, there is an unequal distribution of internet access in Brazil by states, by regions, different uh, from rural to urban regions. There is also an in unequal distribution among uh, users categories. The number of first class users is in fact just part of a digital elite. Those that are able that can have access to broadband and to p computers. And internet dissemination in Brazil, it seems to have a consistency in terms of stability, where we see an expansion in the access level, but maintenance of a stable level of inequalities among different users' categories and also among uh, territories and regions. So we expect that benefits taken by internet, they are not equally distributed among uh, people and regions. And such an inequality, um, understanding this level of an inequality is key to be able to understand all benefits. And if we try to measure what, uh, what is associated to that standard, as there is an association between uh, municipalities, and if we try to understand what is the level of uh, inequality between real earnings and supply of first class services. This is a quite straightforward information, which does not confirm the idea that this inequality among states is necessarily associated to earnings. That is rather associated to poverty, not it seems that it, it is poverty, not inequality, that reduces supply. The higher the poverty, the lower internet access, and such a standard is consistent to our most recent, recent data. So what seems to be the main mechanisms here, which was also significant to some other sort of uh, public services, such as water, several utilities, water, uh, electricity, gas, public utilities in general. It's up to providers to offer or not that service, and that offer is associated to users' income level.
which explains a consistent association between digital inequality and uh, some other information we have about water, education, access, sewage, defining that uh, poverty concentration is responsible to decrease uh, services of quality. P the provider is the one to understand and assess what is the potential market that will accept that service and the decision is made based on that potential prospective market income. That's why spatial poverty concentration it seems to be more relevant than inequality. So the poverty concentration and digital inequalities, they tend to be associated, which means that two subjects with the same level of income, but living at uh, different regions with different levels of poverty concentration, they will have different lives. So a subject which co who comes from a poor area with a low income will have a different life from someone who still has low income but who comes from a richer area. That's it for now and thank you for your attention. Obrigado. Thank you very much. Let me invite Francisco Gaetani. He has 50 minutes. You see, Professor Gaetani, we've been reading your publications together with Virgilio Almeida, the coordinator of the CGI approaching the challenges of uh, digital inequalities and how it, how it really impacts everything we do. So I would like now to hand it over to you so that you can give us your perspective. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. I feel somewhat pressed uh, owing to the excellent quality of presentations But I feel comfortable when people call me as a practitioner rather than a researcher, full-time academic researcher. There is a US proverb saying that all policy is local, all politics is local, but all policy, all politics is local and personal. Brasilia, for example, where people do not exist. We just work there temporarily. I think we are dealing with a reality of multiple asymmetries of the purpose area and what we do. We have uh, finance and legal stuff defining everything. Legal corporate, uh, corporate work generating really asymmetric kind of service provision. Technical memory, documentation, very few organizations take good care of it. When we go over the history of the US, and uh, the United States, they have wonderful time histories. Here we have some gaps now and then, which tend to get worse. When we talk about municipalities, we can have uh, the city registrations or rural and urban maps, and you work with that and know they are not exactly robust. You have, we also have a tax distribution, which is quite complex, and infrastructure. Technology infrastructure is equally important. 
Living in cities such as Sao Paulo and other large centers, it's as if we lived in Naples, uh, civilizations over civilizations. This is how we have here, cities over cities, building one upon the other. So depending on where you are, the district you visit, you are in one specific decade of the history of the country. Local and digital. Such a rich discussion, isn't it? It's really amazing to observe that. And it's a, uh, it's a hope to most of us here in Brazil. Technology is maximized in applying the local plans. So at uh, state and federal discussions, uh, it, it really takes longer. But things can be done much faster locally. We have municipalities now progressing to cloud. They all have their own specific systems. But technology has getting faster and faster and bringing new challenges and promoting really major changes. We are all dealing with the challenge of digital requalification. And I think we've heard wonderful presentations about the challenge of retraining labor, especially of civil servants. And this is a country where we have really a, a symmetry of controls. It's difficult to deal with the backlogs. All government agencies have this huge backlog uh, of legacy systems, and it's difficult to deal with them. Can we really rely on technology to do to break with the inertia, revert the trend, and really start dealing with new patterns? Technology may maximize inequalities as well as to reduce them. And we still do not have a final answer to that. Brazil, according to this report, it's the third country where people spend most of the time on internet. We are also the country where we have more people concerned about fake news. Fourth to United Kingdom and Portugal who have been through political processes. So we spend a lot of time on the internet. We are very concerned about fake news. And then we have this survey which we can call about cognitive dissonance, different topics, and how the population perceives the problem. And uh, we really have a major discrepancy. So once again, Brazil has a lot of cognitive dissonance. We think we are Pacific, cordial, nice, but we have one of the uh, most, uh, one of the highest violent rates in the world. So three interesting pieces of information, more time on the internet, more concerned about fake news, and still schizophrenic. We don't know much about ourselves. The discussion concerning innovations really uh, has uh, required one specific analysis. O OCD o has really been studying that, and we have overlapping here. Inno incremental innovations, those related to adaptation of what's going on, anticipation uh, tendencies. Broadband was a very important discussion in the country. The, the digital strategy in the end of last government was very important. So these debates are open-ended. We discuss innovation, and there are here some people who work with innovation in the city administration, for example, of Sao Paulo. Digital revolution. We are discussing really uh, constantly, but we rarely discuss the grits and bits of every day. This is the behavior unit of uh, uh, the United Kingdom. 
And if you get each point of this cloud, it's a different methodology, a way of working, public interest, private public partnerships. We have never had such a broad repertoire of tools and methodologies to transform things. And many of them have been maximized thanks to digital revolution. So our toolkit is extremely interesting and rich. When I accepted the invitation to speak to you this afternoon, I accepted the invitation because we are here to talk about inequalities. Some people say it's not a problem in the country. Well, inequality, many people don't think this is a problem. Maybe it's a problem of God's divine justice, lack of circumstances, inappropriate market opportunities. I don't know. If you don't think inequality is a problem, you certainly have a problem. Well, access to mass transportation, access to retail. So not in my backyard. Nobody wants an airport or a landfill or a, a park close to us. We have a generation where people are not studying, not working, not looking for anything. Really, people think they have control because they have this dashboard of everything that is being done. A break between uh, work and uh, uh, really what a job means, so the gig economy. I think Marta could definitely uh, talk more about that. We have a variable geometry in our federal management but the guidelines of health are different from that all of education, which are different from that of public security, which are different from housing and so on and so forth. So it's difficult for everyone to understand who should we complain it to? Who is there to talk? Uh, who is there to listen to our complaints? We really don't know how we can deal with the intergovernmental agents, uh, agendas. And let me emphasize the importance of database creation. Of all the different databases with which we work, and you've been doing a wonderful job here in this organization, but we have a very serious problem because all organizations are today at stake. IBGE, the National Institute of Spatial Research, IBAMA, uh, the, proper, uh, the Intellectual Property Institute, all of them. They are currently, the government, better saying, is currently discussing whether we should have these uh, public agents, agents involved in producing data or whether the government should simply hire private entities. This is the current discussion going on. Now, coming back to the human factor, most of you who work with the government, you know that you think depending on where you are sitting. Your opinion depends on how you are discussing the problem. We can see Senator José Serra. He was a minister of planning at some time, and uh, he was against uh, correlating uh, income to investments. Then when he became the Minister of Health, he had a completely different perspective. It's not only him, it's everyone. Depending on uh, the area you visit and uh, the reality we, you come across, you can see different levels of uh, progress. Large multinational companies have very well established corporate standards. In the public sector, these are different, uh, really, examples. examples. We do have some uh, uh, hard and uh, reliable institutions such as uh, education and inspection and really people do not matter anymore because they are strong hubs now. It all depends on what kind of practice community we have. From a technology perspective, we see the advance of telework or work remote work, and everything has been 
postpone. So uh, job relations, retirement, everything has been changing. You, you probably cannot read the slide, but OCD talks about six new key competence for digital, uh, the digital world. So digital literacy, focus on users, curiosity, something that nobody has in the civil, um, in, in the uh, public work. And there's also a category named insurgents. When you talk about key competences, nobody has the six of them. Sometimes they don't have a, people do not, do not have any of them. But let's see how are the countries working on improving their competences. Partnerships are important. We are really working within an environment in which local partnerships are very strategic because local governance is not done by the city administration, but a set of players involved in it. And I'm concerned about some asymmetry. For example, Amazon or Microsoft staff or Facebook interacting with the procurement uh, staff of a city administration. Not very well balanced, but anyway. So I come to my conclusions. We have a new world with many possibilities. Intergovernmental relations are much more complex. Market tensions are getting worse. Some cities are bundles of algorithms. Someone said the mindset of an algorithm the other day. Mindset of an algorithm? Well, Rather than politics, today we have algorithms, it seems, and cities are producing different algorithms as well. Public interest is at stake all over the world. Technological reductionism is considered a, the best. Public services come into its end, really tending to privatize most of the services in Brazil. If we are going to further uh, enhance inequalities, what's going to happen, really? We have multiple powers. Google has more power over Sao Paulo than probably the president of Brazil or the governor of the state of Sao Paulo. And we have to bring together the aspect of generation, digital role, and institution. And these are some of the movies which I think can help us deal with uh, this brand new world. I think it's always wonderful to see uh, because the combination of climate change, digital revolution, and longevity is really part of the global agenda. And they are all converging towards our future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me open now for the audience to see if there are any questions. Who would like to ask a question? Please raise your hand and the microphone will be taken to you. And I'm going, let's hear two or three questions and then we can go. I'm Marco. I worked at Embratel for 30 years. Today I am uh, have my own business and I'm interested in infrastructure of uh, telecom networks. I've heard the presentation of uh, Karen Mosberg, and I'm really wondering if our uh, ICT service is really using the same language. What is broadband? What is the s speed? Because here, broadband was anything higher than 4 megawatt. And what is mobile broadband? Is it also speed? Is it technology? What is the concept of broadband that was used in your survey? I'd like to make very brief reference because last month I met a small, uh, it's a very nice story I have to tell you and I'm going to tell you very briefly. 23 year old boy who studies mechanical engineering in one university in Rio. His father was an alcoholic, lived in a suburb area in Rio, at primary school and secondary school, 
He had never had classes of mathematics or physics. And he is still studying engineering. So I asked, how have you learned it? And he said, well, I've learned by teaching it. I said, how could you teach it? Well, I asked book one day before, studied the book, and then taught it to the other boys in my community. And that's how he got to university. Then he had a small provider at Vilar de Tedes. He, he had 80 clients. And the people in the next door neighborhood, which is called Belfort Rocho in Rio de Janeiro, started asking him to provide services as well. So he had 800 customers in Belfort Rocho. And what's interesting is that once he uh, achieved 880 uh, clients, the drug trafficking said, you have to leave the neighborhood. He had to leave, he lost his clients, and he was also uh, attacked in a attack. A 24-year-old, a digital entrepreneur who cannot succeed in Brazil. And this is not related to public policy only. This is something that we really have to think about. So I would like to know more about the concept of broadband used in your survey and the one used here at our local survey, please. Anyone else? Good afternoon, I'm Thais. I am a researcher at the study of violence in the University of Sao Paulo. For about one year, we've been working as part of a team with data from public uh, safety and, and security here in Sao Paulo. And what we've been discussing is to what extent We have databases which are not really picturing the reality, but rather what had been reported only. And I'm really wondering uh, whether we should really have more internet, more broadband access, and uh, everyone says that if the police has access to that, uh, have access to that, we are going to have better data, better database. Now. Uh, hearing Professor Marta Rash and what she presented, I really don't know whether that would be the case or not. Do you think that internet access is uh, doing as good or not? Rather than having highly digitalized databases and having access to more people, maybe we are excluding people, uh, once again, people who are not included in database. IBG, the Brazilian Institute of Statistics, does not work with uh, data from homeless people. So the data we have are for people who have a home, a formal home, and they exclude part of the population who is homeless. So they are only accounted if they die, then they go into the statistics. So is digitalization really enhancing this discrepancy? I'm sorry if I am if I asked too long a question. Good afternoon. I am Diogo from EDEC, Brazilian Institute uh, Consumers Defense. And I have also a question to Dr. Karen. Dr. Mosberger, we as part of a group of uh, academics and activists, we understand that the main paradi paradigm for digital exclusion has to do with households and apparently that is aligned to your comments. We are not facing a very bright time to implement national public policies. Uh, uh, public policies like uh, a bad word. But in the last part of your presentation, you mentioned some local inclusion initiatives. We have a number of them. Some have been mentioned uh, throughout the day, but none of them goes towards people inclusion, towards fixed household accesses. 
if you could elaborate a little bit more. We have a problem which is due to our regulatory environment. Our actions can just be regulated under a federal scope. You may regul regulate consumers' defense, but in telco, this is con constitutionally advocated as being part of the federal sphere. And uh, based on your experiences, I'd like to hear if those experiences, they are included as part of fixed uh, household uh, access or not. As next year we will have municipal elections, we may create something which which we had never thought before in Brazil. Thank you. We have one more question. Yeah, let's then, you know, have all questions asked, and then we open for a round of uh, answers. How about that? Hello, my name is Helio. I work for Anatel, the telco, and I work in the technology and science uh, secretary, and more specifically in broadband. As to access and use, uh, despite all our budget problems, fiscal and taxes issues, there are some chapters which will allow us to offer more infrastructure, such as 5G auction. The public hearing is about to be published soon by the agency, as well as the PLC 79, which is the current uh, 13879 law, which will allow to change that regulatory framework, allowing concession for further authorization that will make a huge difference in terms of VPL and a value to be applied. We have we are quite far away from the United States and other countries, not considering size, but considering different per capita income where there are very poor regions and there is a market gap. And our uh, challenge is to take that infrastructure in optical fiber available to all municipalities. There has been a significant increase in uh, broadband, but uh, is still not offering full capacity, full internet capacity. And my question then is, if you could elaborate a bit more, and considering that in the United States we see differences also between those richer or poorer countries, how to deal with that uh, demand? What sort of tools can you use? As I stated, there are things that we can try to do in terms of infrastructure, but not uh, always enough for people to use that in relation to their income availability. What sort of array? What sort of solution could we submit or could the public power submit in terms of public policy to speed up the effective use of broadband infrastructure? Thank you. Well, let's close now with questions. We have uh, quite enough. But before that, I have a question myself. What, how, so what is exactly the room for the state and federal uh, approach? Each one of them, they have their own way of doing things. And what would be the percentage or how much would each one of they interfere? And as there is no national consensus about what is the broadband uh, average. Maybe you could clarify what you had uh, or you have abroad. We had for this study household connections where at least we would cope with four megabytes per second. There is no technical specification for that, but that was the cut that would better specify regions according to our uh, survey for understanding main differences. 
So maybe if Professor Francis would like to start answering some of the questions. Briefly, let me say two things. Database, once they are exposed, fragilities also became, become visible. States and municipalities, they find it very difficult to spend uh, resources. And that is up to the mayor, to the city hall, to generate them. Th those who had to go to a police station to place any kind of record, you know how difficult that is and complicated. So we have to take things serious. How can the federal government plus IBG be able to solve all problems? Of course, you may uh, better work with data throughout a more sophisticated mechanisms, but uh, who will do what and what is supposed to be more relevant uh, or the most relevant information of all. And that has to be done uh, continuously and not just uh, um, rarely. That example from Belfort Rocho, who which is an area in the state of Rio de Janeiro, the state occupies the territory, and that's not only a problem in Rio de Janeiro, but also in Sao Paulo. There are several territory areas which are not which do not belong to the republic, to the society, but are areas which are occupied by others, those who work with health, education, at the end, with social providers. You know that you can social workers, you know that uh, you cannot do your work if you do not negotiate with some who are responsible for those uh, poor regions. So territorial is an issue and that uh, drives a number of problems. Today, the main information base is not under the public power. Part of the, main, uh, the most part of information is under the financial structure, credit card, banks, environmental aspect is uh, under the satellite images. Therefore, the state power over the database that is decreasing and that will have to be restated, re-agreed by uh, states as well as providers in addition to the big fives in technology that know each one of us much more than we know ourselves. Can I go back to your question when you say that Actually, you raised something which is of uh, my concern as well. I remember a documentary at Global News addressing internet or uh, digital exclusion, but I remember them sharing a story about a girl that lived in a neighborhood with no internet access, then she would go every single day to the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, which would give a better internet access with a faster um, connection. And she worked all day long sitting on a bench at the university just to get their connection. What is that exactly? What will explain someone's success? individual qualities that we cannot uh, see under those studies as they are not able to be observed or they are due to the place or the origin of that place. This is a difficult uh, information to get, but the study mentioned by Karen by Dr. Karen Mosberger and uh, Rash Shetty, who is a Harvard professor, who says that the place has uh, an effect. I mean, the neighborhood, she corrects herself. Uh, he studies the community zones, which is a greater area, greater than just a neighborhood. The community zones, they have an independent effect about subjects. And to control that problem, as he controlled those uh, subjects who migrated versus those who did not, and he 
tries to understand those subjects who migrated not because of their own desire, as he believes that those who did it because they desired that would uh, raise some confusion. All of that just to let you know that all of this is very complicated and difficult, but good studies, they try to control that factor, which is to understand if that uh, prosperity, it has to do with with the level of ambitions of a subject or not. And now the second issue, there is no perfect database. Any database has its own problems, limitations. It's full of plenty of problems, especially because of those who design uh, researches and surveys, they cannot anticipate all questions that we have later on. Those who formulate researches, they do that under some restrictions. And unfortunately, the world does not obey us. So there are several things that we wish we could know, but we can't. So what, what to do? And what is very difficult to do is to know exactly what are the limits of your database and what can you do or what can you answer with the, the, the information you have? So a household uh, ICT will probably exclude those w with no home, the homeless. And the question is, how are you going to get that information and what sort of gain are you getting with that information in mind? Well, the federal part of the Brazilian constitution, this is probably the most difficult part of all the federal issue. But, it would, but it's quite clear to all of us that digital inequalities, they are persistent, they are territorial, and they seem to be quite relevant. Usually, we mix up in Brazil a study about regional inequality and a study about what are governments liable for doing. And I would ask for some additional help to know who is responsible for what in Brazil? I'm not able to say so, but I have the feeling that this is a quite, uh, that this is a territory where several governments, they can uh, uh, carry out public uh, local policies, taking that policy once again into the individual level and not fully regulated by the federal government. Thank you. Now it's you, Professor. Thanks. Um, so on the question about broadband speeds, we didn't ask people specifically, well, we used census data. And what the census questions asked were, do you have cable? Do you have um, fiber? Do you have um, satellite or mobile? Um, didn't ask speeds. Most people in surveys don't really know what their speed is. Um, so it's more useful just to ask how they access the internet. There was a question about dial-up, and we excluded that. Any other kind of internet access, we counted the way the federal government does. They count it all as broadband, although you're right, mobile is slower than most fixed broadband, um, and there are differences between cable and fiber, obviously. Um, the way the US government used, uh, now, uh, as of 2015, defines broadband, though, as um, 25 megabits per second download, but they still, the old definition was four, and they still collect data using the old definition too. So we didn't specifically account for speed because of using the census data and how they asked the question. Um, the other two questions I can in a way combine, uh, talking about the role of local government versus um, uh, federal government. Uh, so uh, before I get to local government, I just want to mention more generally the way that 
broadband, the broadband market is in the US, it's mostly, mostly private sector provision and it's really local monopolies. So there isn't as much competition in the market as in many countries in Europe. Uh, there isn't um, public um, subsidies as in many countries. Um, so that's what makes it more expensive. Um, it, there's, you know, when you have one or two providers, even for big metro areas, um, you know, somebody with DSL and somebody with cable, there's not much reason for them to try to improve their speeds. So we actually have relatively few cities that have gigabit broadband, um, certainly in comparison with Korea and, you know, with many other countries around the world, because the local providers, you know, don't feel that much need. Of course, we have Google Fiber and we have um, some municipal fiber, not very much, but actually states, because cities are governed by states, they're creatures of the state. Um, there are 19 states that have forbidden their cities to have municipal broadband. Um, so, you know, again, the states have actually stepped in to keep down competition because they've got a cozy relationship with the big providers, their monopolies. So that's kind of the context. As far as, and, and I hear you about the federal government, I don't have a lot of, there's not a lot going on at the federal level. There's a small rural broadband infrastructure initiative. But I don't look right now to our federal government in the US doing much on this, in fact, the Federal Communications Commission is cutting some of the subsidies. Um, there is very little that addresses affordability, and this is part of the appeal we make at the end of the book. For many people, it's poverty, it's affordability. Um, skills matter too, but a lot of people can't even get to skills to have enough regular access um, to work on skills because of affordability issues. And so um, there's very little that addresses that. There's a small program at the federal level called Lifeline. It's a subsidy that you can use to get a, a smartphone or fixed broadband. It's very little money. It doesn't cover very much, and it leaves out a lot of people. Um, a few big companies, um, uh, Comcast wanted to merge, um, and so as a concession, uh, they decided that they would offer in their cities um, discounted broadband, it doesn't cover everybody, it's pretty basic, it's still, it's good that it exists, but there are all these gaps, there's not that much that addresses affordability. More competition would make this affordable. Um, there is a need for the federal government to subsidize people, low-income people, I don't see that happening right now. So cities have, they really feel the need from the local population and they see the needs in their neighborhoods. Cities have long um, carried out public access programs and libraries and worked with community groups at the neighborhood level to deliver training. Um, uh, so they've tried to do some things, you mentioned 5G and uh, concessions. So in um, the US, cities have often for these cable monopolies like New York and other places have collected some fees that they use for digital inclusion like public Wi-Fi um, and programs and libraries to try to do something. So San Jose actually um, got, um, they collected fees for 5G rollout. They negotiated some fees that they're using for digital inclusion programs for training for public access, for subsidizing um, adoption. And after that, um, the uh, Federal Communications Commission has outlawed cities from, collect from collecting fees that are more than whatever it costs cities for processing right away. In other words, saying cities can't get this fee that they can in turn use for their residents and digital inclusion, and that's in court now. So you see this where the companies dominate, but we do see local governments um, and some state governments 
acting to try to help the population. It's really at the local level that we see this leadership, and especially there's really a vacuum now at the federal level, so the local level is really important. But they understand the context, too the needs in the different neighborhoods and also um, you know what it takes to get people online what's really important to them to do online um, so there are a lot of advantages to doing things at the local level but the poorest communities with the highest needs have the fewest resources to do this which is the issue Well, thank you very much. I think with that, we are going to close our seminar. I'd like to start by thanking all of you for having been here with us and the partners who have enabled the study, SEBRABI, and uh, the studies of the metro region and this project. I'd like to invite you to come and visit the web's <coughs> web page because you can see other similar studies. Let me thank all the involved teams, especially eBOPI Intelligentsia, a strategic partner for collecting data in digital inclusion, and Setiki teams and two people who coordinated this project, Graziella Castello and Stefania Cantoni, who effectively de enabled the work. We are going to give you one free copy to all of you. Please leave through the empty uh, the, the um, entrance on the back. And we are going to have now a cocktail party where we can interact and talk. Thank you very much. See you next time. <laughs>